It's funny how our Lord seems to play word games with Pilate about his own kingship. And the reason is, which is indicated here in the Gospel passage, that our Lord is not the kind of king that men conceive or understand. He said, my kingdom is not of this world, it's not of this kind at all. Otherwise, as he said, my men would have protected me and defended me. But our Lord's kingship is so different because his very purpose in his reign is to enter in to man's greatest sorrow, to man's destruction, to enter into death itself. And that's why he has allowed himself to be arrested and treated this way. The kingdom of God is so different to anything that man conceives. In 1925, Pope Pius XI established this feast of Jesus Christ, King of the Universe, although back then it was at the end of October. Two years later, in Mexico, Blessed Miguel Pro, a Catholic priest, with his arms outstretched in the form of a cross, cried out, Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. He was shot and martyred. What terrible crime had he committed in a country that was almost completely Catholic for him to be shot this way, executed most hatefully? His crime was to be a Catholic priest and to celebrate Mass in the sacraments. Terrible thing for a priest to do, isn't it? For anyone to do. You see, at that stage in the 1920s, Mexico, the government was hateful of the church and most of the country the church was limited and narrowed and made smaller as far as they could so that religious could not wear their habits outside of the church, priests could not wear clerical gear outside the church. And in most of the country, it was just like in the very land the church had and that was it. And in fact, much land was taken by the government. But then in the city where Miguel Pro was, you weren't allowed to, priests weren't allowed to celebrate mass at all or anything church was completely shut down, completely persecuted, closed. It's horrific, isn't it? And a few years ago, I would have said I could never imagine what that would be like, but now I know to at least a little degree, because as you know, our churches were closed, at least publicly, which baffled me completely. I know the line was, you know, to protect our health, but my brothers and sisters, the problem is, that is faithless. God is first in our lives. God must be above everything. And in fact, when we have serious problems, serious disease, serious sickness, we need God more than anything. Above everything. No one is more important to us. And this is the trouble. We think you know, there are a lot of Christians in this country. We think there are many Catholics in the church. No, there aren't. Because most people who purport to be Christian and Catholic, they don't put God first. He's not number one in their lives. They don't have faith in him. They put faith in man. And what does the scripture say? Put not your trust in mortal men, in princes in whom there is no help. Nothing is more important than our faith. Nothing. God must come first. We need him. And this is the thing, you see, that, that grieves me. I don't want to die. Of course I don't want to die. We've all got to die, though. Our life in this world is limited. No one knows how long we've got. There's no promise how long we can live. Some of us die in the womb. And at every step, every part of life, people die. And I'm not saying we should throw health and life to the wind as if we don't care. Of course not. But God must be first. Above everything. We must trust him. Our whole purpose in this life, our whole existence, is to prepare for the kingdom of God. 
to be part of that kingdom. You know when we say the Our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. What are we praying? We're praying that the kingdom of God, which is given to us at baptism, and we are made part of at baptism, grows within us, increases within us, and makes us ready for the fullness of it in the glory of God, because the kingdom of God is not of this world. It's all to prepare us so that we can go to heaven in God's wonderful glory. That's the whole purpose of our existence. And if we put that first in our thoughts and understand, then we'll find much greater happiness and peace and our purpose will be greater. And we'll realize what God wants of us. What kind of king is Christ Jesus our Lord? Let's have a real look at him for a moment. In his agony in the garden, we are told that the fear was so great that he sweated blood. He cried out to his heavenly father, Father, if it is possible, let this chalice be taken from me. Not my will, but yours be done. And three times he cried this prayer. The agony he went through is something we can barely imagine. Then they arrested him. He was betrayed with a kiss. They arrested him. And, and when they took him, you know, they didn't treat him kindly or anything or with any dignity. They bashed him. They spat on him. They made fun of him right away. Then he was dragged in front of the crowd. Pilate could find nothing wrong with him, but Pilate was a typical weak leader, afraid to stand up, afraid to have courage for the truth. He knew Christ was innocent. He knew it was out of jealousy that they wanted to destroy him. And so to try and placate them, you know, he took the weak way. He had him scourged. And of course, scourging wasn't a nice little thing with little straps. He'd hit, hit a few times, not even 39 times. Our Lord was scourged at least 100 times or maybe up to 120 straps. That's how much they could count on the shroud. And each scourge had three leather straps and at the end of each strap was a little metal barbell. So, and the soldiers, the Roman soldiers were experts at this. Every time they hit him, those barbells dug into his flesh and then tore it out. Over a hundred times Christ bore this. And then that wasn't enough for the soldiers. They again made fun of him, spat on him, hit him, teased him, mocked him, dressed him up as a king, and they plaited thorns into a crown. It wasn't a nice little thing around the head, it was a helmet. And I don't know if you know the anatomy of the head, at least between the skin and the skull, but it's got all these nerves and blood vessels. So when the thorns went in, those nerves that had hit caused agony in our Lord's body and shot into his head. The pain, you know how pain shoots through you? And I was reading this about it and some of the pain went through to the teeth because that's the nerves are connected. You know when you get a terrible toothache, the agony that is? Well, that's what happened. Like, well, his teeth were in agony as well as his whole head and body from the... And every time he moved, it renewed the pain. And he sat there and he bore it. And then they dragged him out in front of everybody. In the famous words of Pilate, et your homo, behold the man. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for them. So Pilate gave in and sent him off to be crucified. The most torturous death known to men. Horrific. And you know, when you're nailed hands and feet, you're strung up on the cross, your lungs filled with fluid, and the, those crucified have to try and stand up for a moment, you know, on that cross to try and get a breath. The agony of our Lord, and all for love. Our King, all for love. For love of us our king this is our king he loves us he suffered willingly happily for us to save us this is our king 
the Lord of compassion, the Lord of mercy. And what he wants from us is love. He wants love from us, intimate love, personal love, a deep relationship of love. So our purpose as believers, as Christians, as Catholics, is to enter into this relationship and to live it, to pray, to come close to him every day of our lives. That our, we set our goal, our greatest goal. You know, we have our work goals, we have other goals in our lives and our desires, but our greatest goal must be him. Everything we do, everything we are, directed towards him, Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. And he is the truest love of our lives. No one is more precious. No one is more wonderful. No one deserves our love as much as him. And he asks us to lift our suffering and our sorrow to him, to unite it to his passion so he can use it for our good and the good of many. You see, he wants to save as many as possible, as many who will be saved. He knows the stubbornness of man, the ignorance of man, the weakness of man. He knows us all. And we who are his, like his disciples, we who are close to him. Remember in the garden again? And he said, could you not stay awake for one hour? Well, let that hour of ours be our cross. And unite it with his, our suffering, our struggle. And let us do it in love. May our love for our Lord, brothers and sisters, with the help of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who stood by her son, whose heart was pierced with the sword of sorrow. May our love grow with her help. And may we be faithful to our Lord and stand by him through our cross. And may we allow Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ to truly reign in our hearts, in our lives, and perhaps even in our country. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.